She won Most Talkative in high school, and she has been running her mouth ever since. Welcome to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast with your host, Lisa Fisher. Okay, here we are. We're talking with uh, Dr. Campbell now. He often has his dog with him, and I'm so sorry. The dog's kind of the star of your social media. I mean, yes. everyone's watching for you, too, but that dog, what what breed is that dog? He's an Irish setter. Okay. Beautiful dog. So big dog, long hair, furry. Yep. Long red hair. Long red hair. Yep. Yes. Eight years old. Starting to get some grays coming in his beard. Same. Me too. Right there. <laughs> I covered mine this morning right before we talked. Okay. Tell me then, because uh, your type of medicine you practice is a specialist, specialist, specialist in what you do, because you also have internal medicine behind your chiropractic degree, right? Correct. So that means internal yes. medicine, uh, diagnosticians. So your goal then is to find out, it's what we all say in functional medicine, why, you know, it's the why we're sick and what's going on. Tell me how you got to that point where you thought, golly, I'm not just going to go to school for this many years. I'm going to add this, this, and this. Yep. So when I got into the chiropractic and naturopathic medical schools, I really thought I was going to be helping injured musicians because I was in undergraduate. I was doing saxophone performance and pre-med I almost did <laughs> okay. surgery. Not yeah, many of those, but go ahead. Not many of those. Um, and I was really debating between being a doctor of saxophone and teaching saxophone in college <laughs> and being a medical doctor and doing ophthalmology and doing surgeries. But most medical doctor MDs who I talked to were really down on the profession. They said it was really competitive, a lot of work. They weren't really able to help people how they wished. And they didn't have great family work-life balance. Most times they were divorced or they had struggling relationships. So every chiropractor and naturopath I talked to loved their life, loved everything about it. So it was much more convincing. So I got into the chiropractic and naturopathic profession to try to help injured musicians. Then when I saw what musicians were actually going through and struggling with my own injuries, they weren't able to take drugs or medications or injections because they had to be mentally with it to perform at a high level. And so they liked the natural route, but they had a lot more going on than just structural health problems. So I thought, well, I'm going to help their injuries by getting into chiropractic and sports rehabilitation and physical therapy type modalities. And I realized that they had a lot of internal inflammatory issues going on. They had gut issues. They had sleep issues. They wow. had anxiety. They yeah. had depression. They have all the things that a normal human has. It's not just one specific small spectrum. And that led me into functional medicine. Like, why is this happening? What's the root cause or what are, are the root causes? And then that led me down internal medicine and neurology and homeopathy and acupuncture and all the rabbit holes in terms of figuring out the whole person and how to help all of them, not just one little aspect of them. So, I, I mean, I sound like I've been uninformed, but I didn't know musicians had a lot of injuries. I mean. They really do. It's a lot of repetitive strain. So, Oh, kind of like a tennis like, player getting tennis elbow or any tendonitis or fing I guess they get fingeritis or. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. A lot of different tendon issues, a lot of different ligament issues, postural issues like playing the flute is not is one sided playing a violin is one sided so you get a lot of uh, asymmetrical shoulder sure. type of overuse injuries for sure um now what is the difference and what what does an osteopath do don't they provide some manipulation as well as traditional western medicine they do yes classically most osteopaths probably now the older osteopaths do more body work they do more massage or soft tissue manipulation or you know back cracking adjustments type of manipulations but the newer DO osteopaths are not as into that in their trainings. So they are more open to functional medicine and nutrition and lab testing and lifestyle type coaching. But they're not being as strongly emphasized in their school training. They're not really using those adjustments as much as a chiropractor would. There are physical therapists, there are doctors of osteopathy who use adjustments and hands-on medicine, but it's not as... Um, pushed or not as emphasized as it used to be a few decades ago. Now, I love your social media, but what is your, we're recording this September 2022, what's your uh, soapbox du jour? Or what is it, what are you really feeling right now you're really passionate about? Right now, I'm really feeling passionate about helping people reintegrate and healing the relationships that were damaged in the last two years. Wow, that's good. That's deep. That's what I'm seeing in clinical practice all the time is people 
either unable to gain back friends or family members or wanting to or their friends and family not yet ready to go there. But I think it's rebuilding the communities that were lost. Did you ever think in the beginning of this, March of 2022, uh, what I'm sorry, March of 2020, that we would be dealing with not just the physical aspects of a virus, but uh, the emotional damage that has been done to families, families that aren't speaking to each other anymore, that don't exchange Christmas gifts, all because of a virus. Yeah. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that would be the position we were in. No, not even for one moment. I don't think anyone could have predicted it, but it was. It was. Uh, it it divided uh, many of us because, and you know, in in all respect to both sides, people are passionate about what they believe is truth, and they want to defend it. Some people were uh, didn't care. I mean, whatever, right? But then there are other others of us that have been passionate. It has. It has um, been damaging <clears throat> for many relationships, but. We, so the, how do you help people then heal from that? I think it's really helping them heal the relationship takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of vulnerability and accountability. And it, I think the main thing is for those people to go back to the relationship they're trying to heal and have that conversation in person. Don't text it. Don't have it over the phone. No. Don't even video chat it. But like meet with them in person. And take accountability for the mistakes you might have made or the things that came off the wrong way. Or maybe you sent too many emails forwarding some strongly opinionated person like you or myself. And that didn't go over well. So I think it's like taking accountability for the mistakes you may have intentionally or unintentionally have made. And then allow the other person to talk, listen with compassion and curiosity, hear their story of where they've been since you've last communicated. A lot of people you know, thought one thing was going to happen or they thought the savior was going to be one medical um, breakthrough technology. They thought the savior would be one medication or one injection. And that just wasn't quite the case. So a lot of people have trusted in certain individuals or government organizations or doctors who have then led them astray. And so I think it's having the compassion and the forgiveness to allow for the mistakes that we've made and that other people have made and then finding common ground. Most everybody wants to do what's right. They want to help people. They want to protect people who are higher risk. They want to be healthy. They want to live long, wonderful lives. And so I think there's a lot of common ground that can be found now that the mainstream narrative and some of the alternative narrative are sort of um, merging together and the truth is finally setting. It's like we finally found truth. The dust is settling. And now it's just coming to terms with how our belief systems were or were not aligned in truth. And now that that's coming together, there's a lot of cognitive distance of people realizing that they might have made mistakes or that the science might have changed or whatever that the, the truth was always the truth. But the science that was promoted was not always in alignment with truth. And so people are realizing that that is often the case. And so they're coming to terms with admitting what may or may not have impacted their lives in a negative way. Well, this is uh, really an appropriate time to discuss this because as we're recording this, this will air probably close to like Thanksgiving and holiday seasons. And that's, you know, that first Thanksgiving, we were not allowed to meet even with our own families, you know, so, right. um, and we've made some strides since then, but I think that would be a good healing time. Have you been able to make some of these, uh, take some of these same steps with your family and friends? Um, yes. Luckily, my family was generally on the same page the whole time, which was great. And we have um, a lot of different people on the left, on the right. We have conventional medical doctors. We have alternative yeah. medical doctors in my family, and we all kind of were loving and accepting and open-minded and respected each other's wishes, which was great. But I do have friends who have been lost or patients who have you know, been lost, Mo- more gained than lost for sure. But there are relationships that were broken and bridges that were burned, usually not by myself. But what I generally would do when they were burned or when those relationships were damaged to some degree is to reach out to those people and really offer them an invitation to return, which is asking them like, I would love to maintain this relationship. When would you like to see me again? Or when would it be okay for us to talk again, to meet in person? When would you feel comfortable? Is it after the 
case numbers are super low? Is it after the government says it's okay? Is it after you're um, going back to church or going out to eat at restaurants again? Can we meet outside? Can we meet inside? So I think it's like leaving it up to them of what level of comfort they feel. And most of those people have come back. They've sort of either gotten the germ, they've gotten sick and they realized it wasn't as scary as they thought, or they realized that, you know, the thing that they thought would be protective was not as protective as they thought. And once they've gone through that illness, once, twice, three times, it starts to lose its fear factor. And that's really when they start going back to their lives, starting bringing more physical touch and comfort and love into their lives again. And I guess we on the side that we're likely on have to realize I don't have to get them to admit that I was right the whole time. You know what I'm saying? I have to get over myself to, because sometimes I go, why aren't people now saying, Lisa, you were right? But I have to get over that. That's pride on my part. So it's just totally. a good reminder. I think this is a good conversation. Totally. And a lot of people will also put out the, well, the generally accepted public knowledge was X, Y, Z. Yeah. So yeah. even though, and they would say like, well, the science changed or the germ changed or whatever, you know, the research changed. Uh, so the, they still won't always admit that even if it was true. But I think that's less important than just managing the relationships. Sort that's of like right. if sort of like if you were a devout Christian and your son or your daughter became Muslim and you saw that as a negative and then they came back to Christianity, then you'd be like, ha, I was right the whole time. Like you messed up. And that is, I think, like beyond us uh, to say whether or not that was a useful or an unuseful time in their life. And the exact opposite could happen, right? It could be like someone who is of an Islamic or Muslim faith who then went to Christianity, went back to Muslim. And they could say, oh, well, that was great or bad. And so we all have our interpretation of what is right or wrong. At the end of the day, I think it's just nice to say, like, I'm happy you're here now with me and let's try to enjoy this present moment rather than judge it for what it is or is not. I mean, mic drop. That is profound. I had no idea we were even going to go, go down this because I thought we were going to talk about all the things with health. But um, I love that. And I'm, I had a little audio thing here. Um, there we go. Um, I'm glad we could pursue that because I think that's healthy for all families, relationships, and um, even your illustration is very visual as a parent and watching your kids make decisions that you're kind of going, you know, is that really the best decision for you? But it's the same fears that our parents had and their parents had, you know, it's just watching somebody blossom and take the route that is best for them. So I think it's great. Okay, now let's kind of hone in on some health things. Uh, 2022 has also brought us um, a lot of um, erroneous uh, information concerning nutrition. And I don't know if it's my ears to the ground now. I'm a now certified health coach. And so it's really what I read, do every day. But when I see um, Bill Gates with his man boobs trying to tell me to eat a Beyond Burger, I, 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 there's some cognitive dissonance right there. I mean, people have got to look at that and think, probably not uh, the health figure I want to emulate. And, and same thing, I mean, that can go on and on. What is worrying you right now about the health mantra that's being preached? I think the biggest worrying thing about the health mantra is that we've lost the philosophy of what it means to eat well and to be, live a healthy, clean yes. life. Yes. We've sort of subjugated health food to technologically advanced food. Some, right. So we're saying, well, we can have the technology to grow organic strawberries in water and hydroponics in Mexico, and that's labeled as organic, even though the nutrient density is about 30 to 50% less than it would be growing organic strawberries in the soil. We've also been able to, you know, genetically engineer meat in a lab that looks like chicken or looks like pork or we have plant-based meats and that right. gives mm. you, you and me the heebie-jeebies and it's mm. like we're we're not eating real food we're eating synthetic fake food and then we be, wonder why people start to become synthetic fake people <laughs> right thus the kardashians because i mean they really are the people who are put, uh, pimping out the beyond burger and and then when I, I I thought the sales of those things were so low that with anything else, if sales aren't good, they reformulate and try again. I don't know if it's been reformulated, but it's still 
um, avail- now I don't eat at fast food restaurants, but I've seen it somewhere that it's still offered. Well, I see it at the grocery store. You know, when I'm getting my real bacon, my um, uncured bacon that I try to get with no nitrates or nitri- nitrites or nitrates. Um, I saw next to it, they still have something called Beyond Meat at the grocery store. Hasn't that, the, the enthusiasm for those products, ha- hasn't that dropped some? I think it has started to drop some, thank goodness. People are starting to um, see what's going on on social media or online or other places, and they're really seeing that most nutritionists who know what they're talking about don't promote synthetic artificial ingredients, which is most of what is in those fake meats. Um, So a lot of people are waking up to it, but any really good, super well-funded marketing campaign like the Kardashians or like Bill Gates or other people um, will for sure make a dent and people will try it but i think intuitively and when people feel what that meat meat or fake meat is like they know that it's not really healthy they know there's inflammatory oils in it they know there's synthetic particles all over that um i would not even give that to my dog you know it's like it's just not good food we give our dogs real meat we give our dogs raw organ meats we give them raw food and healthy food and plants and vegetables and that's what we should ideally be eating too it's kind of a strange world when we would feed our animals something that's more healthy than the own food that we get from the grocery store yeah it's insane uh 2022 is really uh, i mean i know the insanity will just continue because of things like this this is what i want to know how with as many people who are against these industrial seed oils who we are begging people to just throw them away eat real butter tallow pork lard whatever you know you choose we're begging people yet product after product is stocked inside the shelves of the the, the, your grocery store the bulkier grocery store is the inside shelves with the fake foods the thing that has has the least amount of influence is the the produce and then the meats and then the milks are in the back but most of my grocery store, and I don't go often because I have meat dealers and I have other things, you know, that you can get at farmer's markets, wherever you are listening right now. Um, but when I go, I just see aisle after aisle after aisle of things with the processed seed oils. Who, who's going to have to wake up for that to be pulled from shelves? I mean, it's really the general public. When the general public stops buying it, they won't have any market. And so the only way that's really going to happen is if people start realizing that what is actively promoted to them, whether that's on their TV or now even on their Facebook newsfeed or their Google newsfeed, a lot of those mainstream media sources are pushing big agriculture and the products that they invest in. So they're pushing General Mills or they're pushing Kellogg or they're pushing all these large corporations that make most of your cereals and your processed snacks and all the things in the middle of the grocery store. And so until people start realizing, looking around, they're like, hey, the majority of Americans are overweight. The majority of Americans are not healthy. They don't look healthy. They don't feel healthy. They don't sleep well. They are running on coffee to wake up in the morning. They're running on now marijuana or alcohol to fall asleep at night. They're basically drugging themselves into being able to live a normal life. They're realizing that we need to do something different. And if if you do what the majority of people do, you will get the body that looks like the majority of people. You will get health that looks like the majority. If you want to be super healthy, if you want to be even just a normal level of health, you have to do something that is radically different than the average Joe. And that means not eating seed oils. It means not eating processed food. It means eating real food with ingredients that you know what they are, where they come from, um, that you can pronounce the ingredients of that food. And the seed oils are so inflammatory to our body that they can really wreak havoc on your internal chemistry. People don't equate arthritis or brain fog or sleep issues or weight gain or bloating with the oils in their food. They're like, oh, it's sunflower oil. That sounds really nice. Safflower oil sounds great. Uh Vegetable oil. It said heart healthy on one of them for years. Says heart healthy. I mean, Cheerios were one of the top three most pesticide foods in the entire country, but labeled as heart healthy. It's not (laughs) great. Um, you know, you were kind of painting the picture of uh, Americans now of um, they need pra- it, it's almost the Elvis phase. We need an we need an upper to wake up in the morning because we need all this coffee and all this stuff. And then we need a downer at night. And, you know, if you look at it that way, Elvis was ahead of his time. 
He was in his 40s. He was he was overweight before people were really overweight because now remember we talked about skinny Elvis and then fat Elvis or young Elvis and old Elvis. Now people wouldn't make that comparison because you know everyone gets a trophy and we you know we're just glad that he's here and all this. I mean you can't talk about anybody's weight because then we'll get shadow banned. But Elvis really was doing things that should should be a picture to everybody that he just grew up as a sweet Mississippi boy eating his mama's fried chicken. And then once he started incorporating these substances, because he was a substance abuser. I mean, he knows that his family. I mean, we know that because his family's talked about it. And then the crap, remember, he, then he would eat the 19 cheeseburgers or whatever his food addiction was. And that was an addictive person. I mean, he had addictions. And he died in his early 40s. Now people, I think, because of all the medicines they take, are being pumped with something to kind of keep them alive. But they feel as bad as Elvis did in his 40s. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you look at it, if you think of it now, because you kind of said it, um, because remember that he was the first person we knew that took uppers to get up and then downers to go to bed. And that's what so many people say that they need. Well, let's talk about that. Let's. Let's start. I mean, and I do think caffeine, pro, I'm just not a, it's not important to me. And I, it probably, I'm probably super sensitive. It, you know, if I drink it, then I'm up all day or I, I, even at night, I'm bothered. So what do you do to tell people, Dr. Campbell, on, you know, this is what you need to do in the morning to get up, get going. And this is how you start winding down at night. Yeah. So I think the first thing to do in the morning is to try, if you can at all possible, to get outside to get sunlight or early morning sun on your eyes for 15 to 30 minutes. It's what I did for four years. I was living right on Lake Michigan off Chicago and I would wake up and go walk the beach so I see the sun come up over the horizon. And it's the best way to set your day off in a, the right way. And that gets your circadian rhythm optimized, your stress hormones optimized, your melatonin naturally producing at night when it's darker to contrast that morning sun. So getting outside for at least 15, if not 30 minutes, go for a walk, take your dog for a walk, take your cat or your lizard or your parrot for a walk, whatever it is, just get outside, take your kids out, whatever it is, maybe eat your breakfast outside on the porch or the patio. Um, and no sunglasses. No sunglasses at that pretty, time. Yeah. Look, yep. look, yeah, get, get the sunlight. Get the sunlight on your eyeballs without sunglasses or anything getting in between. Um, that would be the first step. The second step is to eat anything, something for breakfast. If you are going to have caffeine, at least eat something, even if it's like a few berries before you have the caffeine and then slowly build up to making a little bit of bigger breakfast. If you're intermittent fasting, that's a little bit different, but I generally recommend intermittent fasters to skip dinner rather than breakfast. But that's a whole complicated subject we can get into later. But the f main thing is wake up, get sunlight, and then eat a little bit. Try to move a little bit, and that'll start the day off well. Um, because then you're, it's like if you're putting caffeine on your energy fire, you think of your, your f energy for the day as a little fire that's always burning. If you just pour caffeine on it, it's like pouring gasoline on your fire. It gives you a lot of ATP, a lot of cellular energy, but then you fizzle out a few hours later. And that's when people need another round of caffeine before mm -hmm. or after lunch. And they start getting those afternoon tiredness waves. So if you eat a big meal full of either fat or protein, then you're going to put a big log on that fire. So you have a lot of energy to burn throughout the whole morning to get you through to lunch. So you're not going to be craving any sugar before lunch. You're not going to be hungry or hangry or irritable at 10 or 11 a.m. You're not going to be kind of slowly sipping on that caffeine to kind of keep pouring some gasoline on your fire to keep you going. So main thing is get sunlight and get some fat or protein for breakfast, which will really fuel you to start the day off right. Dr. Huberman, in one of his podcasts recently, talked about sleep, spent, you know, an hour and a half, two hours on sleep, and it was fascinating. And my favorite thing he said was, your sleep cycle tonight is dependent on what you did this morning. 100%. And, yeah, and I really was not aware of that until the last year, and it has totally changed my life. I mean, totally changed my life of getting that sunlight in the morning. Now, the risk you have being as far north as you are... Um, do you then, what about your, because daytime sunlight is another thing I try to get. Now I'm in Little Rock, so I'm at right at the latitude line where it's, I'm okay. But they say anything north of like Memphis, you might need um, a sun lamp at home or something to create some of that. Have you had to do that in Chicago? I have not. I know there's a lot of patients who get seasonal affective disorder, SAD, yeah. where they're a little sad in the wintertime and they'll get a 10,000 lux lamp. 
or higher in order 10, 15, 20 minutes a day to kind of give them some of that extra um, light source and vitamin D production in the winter, which does help the seasonal affective disorder. But for the most part, we have patients just supplement with a little vitamin D3 and K2. Usually 1,000 I use, up to 5,000 I use a day, and we check their blood levels to make sure they're not overdosing it. But just a little bit of that through late fall into spring is helpful. But even this far north of the equator, when you're above Memphis, you really do still get vitamin D levels, and you even get vitamin D levels um, being produced in your body from cloudy days. So a lot of people say, well, it's cloudy, it's cold, it's yeah. rainy. It don't." Mm -hmm. But even on those days, the sun is strong enough to shine through the clouds and still benefit your mood, get to your eyeballs, produce more vitamin D. So there's really no excuse. You want to get outside, be as naked as you can, that's legal, and get as much sun exposure as you can yeah. onto your skin because that's what's really going to help you um, – even later in the year, your sun exposure during the summer will give you ideally enough storage bank, like a savings account of vitamin D through the winter to get you through. But if you're not out in the spring to fall seasons, it's going to be a lot more of a struggle later on. Kind of like getting that sunrise in the morning helps your sleep later. It's the amount of outdoors time you get when it's nice will also get you through those tougher winter months. You know, the Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And to me, that is another um, nod to that because the way that we do bank what we got all summer, we have hot Arkansas summers here. We have a lot of sunlight. You know, we feel like we're at the equator and the summer in Arkansas, it's bad. Uh, but we'll have a little, I mean, we have five minutes of winter here, but we do have darker days, but it's amazing how our bodies then hold on to that and get us through till the next season. Um, okay, I'm a, in November, I celebrate five years of intermittent fasting, totally changed my life. I reversed all of my uh, autoimmune conditions, but one still working on, I'm working on my vitiligo now by eating a nose to tail diet and I am repigmenting. My face is repigmenting, so I'm Great. Really excited, but all my other autoimmune conditions are at bay. I mean, I do have to take thyroid hormone replacement because mm -hmm. the little gland died after 20 years of me not treating not looking at the root cause, but me just taking them at it, just having high antibodies, but my antibodies are under 39. They're fine. Um, but all that to say, um, it, we're recording this at 10 in the morning and I'm not even close to being hungry. So I won't be hungry today till one or two, let's say one, maybe two o'clock. And then I like to eat like one to four or two to six or something. So are you saying I need to switch that and try to do a morning meal and a lunch meal? Is that what you prefer? Well, for many people, yes, but it's very much dependent on what works for you and your lifestyle. I'd say my average patient patient is not super self-aware, especially when they're a new patient, and they're generally in a state of high stress. And so okay. they're going in the morning, whether it's caffeine, which increases your cortisol, your stress hormone, yeah. or they're getting up and going through rush hour traffic. They're generally stressed out in the mornings. And so I'd rather that they were fueling with food in the morning time, whether that's breakfast or a brunch type of meal. So they're not because they'll wake up, run on stress hormones, and then they'll eat and they'll kind of have that to get them through the rest of the day. Um, and they may or may not be able to convert easily between burning carbohydrates and burning the fat for fat-based metabolism, which is what the goal is in intermittent fasting. So when people are less stressed out, they're able to intermittent fast better. If they have more stress in their lives, then intermittent fasting can be a little bit trickier. The other thing is if you are a female who is still having reproductive um, cycles or menstrual cycles, then sometimes intermittent fasting puts a little bit more stress on that hormonal cycle system. And so it can throw off fertility or throw off menstrual cycles for women. If you're over 45, generally it's a lot easier to intermittent fast and much better to do so. I really do like intermittent fasting for a wide variety of reasons, mostly because of it gets you into fat burning mode. It doesn't, it makes sure for many people that they're not overeating food because a lot of people just overeat and overconsume. Even if it's healthy calories, they might be having too many calories. So it does help in a weight and metabolism standpoint, it does help with sleep, helps with inflammation, helps with, you know, cellular apoptosis, autophagy which is kind of cleaning up the bad cells and debris in your body. So many, I mean, I'm, as you know, it helps with immune system mm -hmm. su support. There's a, many, many benefits. But I do generally start people off with sort of um, skipping the dinner and eating the breakfast, which is a little bit opposite to how a lot of the intermittent fasting influencers promote it. 
Well, uh, Dr. Fung says in his materials, and a couple of others do too, and that's why this is going to be a challenge as we change our time, that we need to have our meal consumed before the sun sets. And so when we change our time in November, and this may air around then, um, we'll have, you know, it'll be 5.30 or 5.15, 5 o'clock, you know, and it's hard. So many of my clients, I, this is my first year to understand that, uh, with the, my clients, so so far they've been fine, but November through March, you know, people are just getting off work at five o'clock, so it may do them well now. I may switch them to a morning lunch pattern if it works. A lot of things, as you know, a lot of times people will say it's difficult for their families because they do want to sit down with their family. I say that with this caveat. So many people have said, my family doesn't care if I'm not eating, as long as I'm there. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's really helpful for uh, uh, so many reasons for people to disassociate food from community love. When they're eating out, uh, they'll associate wine, you know, like they have to join in and have a glass of wine in order to be accepted. So if you can go to a dinner and not eat, the other person might feel a little awkward eating in front of you when you're not eating. There's that dynamic. But the more you can start to get your friend group to accept that everyone may or may not eat, everyone may or may not drink or have alcohol or a cocktail. They might have mocktail, they might have water. That has so many other benefits that I really encourage people to be courageous enough to be slightly different than the people you're with. Oh, I, I've i always been slightly different, so I get that. But I was just at an event last week and it was a brunch, 10 to noon, and people are having a cocktail, uh, I mean, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care what anyone does with their body. I can tell you that. But when they came by, the girl next to me said, oh, you're not eating. Is something wrong? And she goes, oh, yeah, you're one of those fasters. And I said, truly, it wasn't about fasting. I truly wasn't hungry. I mean, because I could have manipulated my fast by not, you know, maybe not eating dinner the day before. But it, it's also I think we need to get to the point where if you're not hungry, don't eat. It's okay. It's not a crime. Correct. Yeah. So many people, I think, eat because they're patterned to, not because they're actually hungry. Just listening to your body and going intuitively is remarkable. I've had so many people with digestive issues just solve them sheerly by eating intuitively. Yeah. It it sounds crazy because, again, Western medicine, and, you know, we talked the other thing. I think the other battle we have, not just Western medicine, but nutritionists who graduate with uh, degrees in dietetics from uh, state-sponsored schools are being told to tell people to eat six times a day. I mean, I have to battle this when I have clients that say, but my heart doctor's dietitian told me to eat, you know, six times a day and to have canola oil twice a day if possible. And I just, you know, I, I, it just makes me put my head in my hands uh, so how, how do you combat that of just also telling people, or do, do you feel like you battle then with traditional dietitians who aren't open-minded? I try not to battle too much. I'm a little bit more of a peaceful warrior, but for the most part, I sort of just say like, look, their option is this and their results are this. And they generally say yeah. like, you're not going to get better. The plaque's not going to go away. You're not going to heal. We're just yeah. managing your disease. I'm like, would you rather manage oh. your disease or would you rather return to health. And you're saying like, I've had success getting plaque coming off people's arteries. I have success reversing disease or getting them off of medication. So you can either stay on medications and then slowly go on more until you die and that's fine. Or you can do it this other way. So you just give them the options and educate. And I think when people truly are educated, they generally will choose the healthier route, even if it is a little bit tougher of a, um, a path because it leads to more empowerment, more control, more freedom, and a better quality of life long term. Okay, let's talk about the adrenals. I, I think they're misunderstood, and I think I misunderstand them because um, when people will say that they are in, having trouble with their adrenals, does that mean that they're saying they're producing too much cortisol at night? Because their adrenals are responsible for the cortisol, right? Yes, yeah. So does that mean they flipped it and then they don't have much cortisol in the morning and they have too much at night? It can be. There's three main maladaptations or ways that the adrenals can misfunction. They're sort of like stages. There's 
the first stage where people are more stressed and wired and tired. So their cortisol, their stress hormones will go really high and they'll feel sometimes really like anxious or wired or they can't sleep at night, but they'll also feel tired at other points. So you're getting high and lows. Then the second phase okay. is, um, well, actually the first stage is ba- basically just anxious. They're like super wired. So I said this slightly wrong. The second stage is where they're wired and tired. And the third stage is more of just okay. a flat burnout phase. And so that's really where they don't have energy, any energy at all. And sometimes they can't even sleep because it actually takes energy to sleep. So they'll be tired during the day and they <laughs> won't even be able to have enough energy to fall asleep or stay asleep the whole time at night. So is this where the ashwagandha is good and, or adaptogens at that point? Yes. At that point, you really have to do stress reduction or stress adaptation types of things, getting them out in nature with the natural things. It's like all the basics, the more sick someone is, the more the basics become really important. So getting them eating enough really good quality food and all the adaptogens are very helpful at any stage, but especially that last stage. Um, so ashwagandha, a lot of the uppers, more of like rhodiola and ginseng and maca, things like that are very helpful in that last stage, as well are adrenal glandulars. So actually eating glandular extracts from the adrenal gland of different animals will help that late burnout stage patient. Does that same philosophy work with um, thyroid replacement? Sometimes people ask me, they'll say that they found lamb thyroid at the nature, you know, their natural grocery store. And because maybe they're, because sometimes a traditional doctor may not be on board and understanding the way the thyroid, how complex it works. And it isn't just TSH. It's also all these inflammatory markers. I'm, I'm that person. It took years before I got diagnosed because my TSH was right at 3.8 and they'd go, well, you're fine. And I go, <laughs> you know, no, I was not fine. Um, and finally have some, somebody looked at my antibodies and they were off the page. But what do you think about the glandular replacements then for thyroid dysfunction um they can be very helpful you there are ones that do contain some thyroid hormone in it so you have to be a little careful to see if the t4 has been removed or not from what you're taking because some people will start taking a thyroid extract that doesn't have that on the label and they'll actually be dosing themselves with more thyroid hormone like a medication um so You have to be a little careful of that. However, the thyroid glandulars are generally very helpful because they contain a lot of the nutrients to rebuild your thyroid. So for most people, they do well with very good quality thyroid glandular supplements. Um, Another thing that you were talking about stress that I've really started to understand is our uh, insulin and glucose response to stress. So I guess our glucose response because... um, a fellow intermittent faster was using her CGM recently and she's lost 81 pounds with fasting. I mean, she has a great success story, but she hadn't eaten yet that day. And she was having to testify in a court case that her daughter was involved in. She was so stressed. Her blood glucose without eating jumped to 150. So doesn't that show us then that the person under constant stress that is one of the reasons for weight gain, where people say, I didn't do anything different. Nothing has changed, but I'm going through a divorce, or I lost a child, or I lost my job, or I had to move, or whatever stressful for you. H- have you seen that before, that the actual blood sugar responds to stress? Definitely. We see that all the time. It can be psychoemotional stress, like going to a court, testifying case. It can be not sleeping. It could be people who are, you know, their body's going, think it's going into starvation mode. Those are the people where sometimes they don't, those rare people who don't respond to fasting of some sort, their body will go into stress state. Or it can be a lot of times chronic pain. Physical stress can cause Uh a lot of elevations in cortisol and glucose blood sugar. Do you use CGMs? Do you think they're uh, important for people just your garden variety person without type one or type two diabetes to have? I think they're very, very useful. I do use them. Um, I think I don't use them on the patients that are more of having a predisposition to being a hypochondriac. So for the people who are already in the like orthorexia, over controlling, limiting too much of their food, that can sometimes be harmful. But for most people, it's a really, really great tool in order to figure out how their body is responding to what they're eating. 
And so many people are realizing, wow, I was eating way too much rice or simple carbohydrates or that oat milk was really spiking my blood sugar more than I thought it was. So I'll switch to an almond milk and that does better or whatever it is. They really gain a lot of awareness about what they're eating and drinking and how that impacts their internal health. What's your opinion then on the high control orthorexics? Um, how, how do you talk them off the ledge and get them to start seeing things as it really is not in their control paradigm? I think the main thing is finding a way to show them how their stress about food is negatively impacting their life or their health and that it's always mental health first over physical health. And so if it's not causing a problem for them, sometimes it's hard to get them to change, but you can do some motivational interviewing type of questions to really get them to shift their mindset or be a little bit more open-minded to changing the way they think about food. A lot of times I'll refer them to eating to, not reading different books about intuitive eating or podcasts about intuitive eating to really get them to shift their mindset around their relationship with food. Whether it's people who are a little overly controlled and not wanting any toxic little bits in anything that they eat. It yeah. could be because that mm -hmm. was serving them in the past, whether they were had more chemical sensitivities or they had more um, food sensitivities or reactions to certain things that often was serving them in the past, but it's no longer serving them in the present. But the orthorexic um, type of people who are extreme health um, people or even people just with day to day like wanting to lose five pounds, 15 pounds type of people, those people as well often have to look at their relationship with food and how they interact with it because it's not really just the food. It's how we view it, how it serves us, um, and it really is what we become at the end of the day. The only thing, we become a new human every seven years, and the only way that happens is by what we eat, what we drink, what we breathe. Let's talk about chubby kids. We have an epidemic of chubby kids, but I, I would hope we aren't preaching to our kids about diets or calor caloric deprivation or anything that puts them on, man, bad mojo for the rest of their lives then about food. I don't want food to be an enemy, but how, what's a good way to incorporate, um, and I don't want to say healthy eating because that is a movable target what you call what someone calls healthy they might call the beyond burger healthy and i don't call it healthy so how do you handle parents with chubby kids the biggest thing is usually getting parents to be okay with their kids being upset so generally it's getting a lot of the non-real food out of the house so not even calling it like healthy food yeah. just calling it like is this real food or is this not real food so it's yeah. viewing it as getting all the junk food all the processed food out of the house you're not going to likely be able to limit children once they have friend groups once they're going to school and getting yeah. food from their friends and going to the 7-eleven on their breaks and all that but what you can do is make your house a safe place where they're getting real food at home and no unreal food is allowed into your house and that can be a very hard transition period of days to weeks or even months where their taste buds have to start to change. And they, most children are addicted to sugar. They're addicted to gluten and mm -hmm. dairy. The casein mm -hmm. is addicting in a way similar to the way that cocaine um, stimulates dopamine reward centers in your brain. A lot of the food is purposely made to be addictive. So your child is going to go through withdrawal when you start to shift those patterns of what's in the house. And the hardest part about that is parents who like being liked by their kids. Sorry, there's some cicadas coming around. Um, but I hear them. <laughs> I think the hardest part is parents just have to realize that they're not, their children might not like them for a little bit, but after a few days, after a few weeks, when their taste buds and their brains start to recalibrate, they're going to start um, realizing that parents are doing this out of love, not out of restricting or limiting or not liking their children or being mean to their children. Um, I've heard Jen Stevens, who I call the mother of intermittent fasting, you know, the foremost lay authority on intermittent fasting, say that when she was an educator, that in the 30 years she was an educator almost, that, um, you know, in the 90s, you kids couldn't bring a drink or anything to class. And then as it went on, all day kids were sipping 
and I'm talking about things that incite your insulin and your glucose, not not just water. Right. But they're all day sipping now constantly, and we know that insulin's job, besides to push glucose in cells, is to store fat. I mean, so though it may be, you know, maybe apple juice, that's so innocent. No, it's not, <laughs> you know, not not long term. And so it, it's kind of taking that philosophy of kids are going to class with Starbucks. They're drinking $8 drinks you know, through the morning period, then they go to lunch and get something. And then at lunch, they get something and take them to three o'clock. And then, so it it's it's a paradigm shift, shift for parents too, that it's okay if your kid doesn't have a drink during the day. Yep. Or if they're asking for a snack, it's okay to tell them, we're going to wait for dinner. It's okay yeah. for them to be hungry. Yeah. It's okay for them not to be constantly um, having all of their needs met. Right. I totally agree. I'm the biggest butthole parent you've ever met and i'm proud of it and you know what i've raised three great adults that i'm really proud of um now let's take that and (laughs) parlay that into adults kids with their snacks are is equal to adults with their hooch it's also telling i i i think and that's a paradigm shift i'm seeing maybe it's because social media is pointing social media is pointing to it that we're drinking too much. Well, no one really wants to say that because it's wine o'clock. It's mommy's, you know, little helper or whatever. Mommy's juice that she has in her sippy cup, you yeah. know. Um, it's okay to start talking about the fact that we're drinking too much and how inflammatory that is. How do you feel about that? I always say do your drugs with a purpose, not every day. <laughs> so whether okay. it's alcohol, caffeine, whatever it is. Unless it's prescribed you to take every day, it's in your best interest not to take those substances on a regular basis and do them with intention and with a purpose. Because research now has shown that even three glasses a week is more likely to increase your rate of dementia. So three glasses of hooch or alcohol is problematic. So when people are like, well, I only drink on the weekends, but I drink um, one cocktail and a beer. Well, you just definitely increased your risk for dementia, which is what most people are worried about is cancer and dementia. Alcohol is a carcinogen. It destroys your brain cells. It destroys your tissues of your body. And it's basically like the modern day cigarette. Back in the 60s, doctors were saying like, oh, it's not that bad. It's fine. You can have it. It's super healthy for you, actually. Now they're sort of saying like, you know, a couple glasses of red wine is healthy for you. But my um, wine growing friends are not happy when I talk about this. Yet I have to just be honest with my patients and say, look, yeah. the healthiest amount of alcohol is zero. Now, the only contradiction yeah. to that is when you're because your mental health is more important than your physical health. If you're using wine to be a sommelier, if you're using wine to be a wine farmer, if it's serving your purpose on this planet and it's serving you fostering relationships and community, then that is far above and beyond the physical detriments of alcohol. But don't drink a whole bottle of wine a night. Like still enjoy it. Use it with a purpose. Use it for community and love and getting together. If you're going to lose your friend groups, then you're going to go into depression and then your whole life is going to be horrible. Then maybe don't stop drinking. But maybe you start to have this conversation with some of your friends who go out and everybody gets a drink. And you're saying, hey, maybe we'll drink like two half glasses instead of four full glasses or whatever it is. You might have one night a week where you make mocktails or you do kombucha or you do tea instead of um, cocktails. So it's just starting to shift the paradigm with your collective groups and with yourself about those relationships. Um, Because at the end of the day, the healthiest physical, physical healthy amount of alcohol is zero or close to it. I still personally drink a little bit, but I do it maybe once a month and it's with people where that is their love language. Like their love language is they were about to start a cocktail bar in the pandemic. And so they love making cocktails and giving to people. But even then, I'll still have a couple sips and I'll give it to my other friends who are still, um, you know, harming their brains and happy about it. Because sometimes there are things in us that we need to kill, you know, some. (laughs) But I also think the more we pursue what's best health for our bodies, the less desire we have and the less it just doesn't taste as good. It Some, does not. So, uh, something has happened to me that I don't, I don't care or crave it. I might have a cocktail, again, a social situation. And again, I'm not saying this to look at me. I, it, it's just the, the metamorphosis of where I've come. Yeah. 
in my years and on this earth. So, so many people, when they do take breaks and go back to it, if they're really calm and being mindful, they'll notice that the day after is not the same. They need a little more coffee. Right. They're not as, they're right. a little more, less yeah. clear. They're a little more foggy. They're a little more tired. They're yeah. a little more achy. And so then they have to ask themselves, do I want that for my life? And that's when it starts to shift, yeah. when people start to realize they have a choice and they can decide if they want that day after or they want to have a better day after. Yeah, a clear day after. Uh, Max Lugavere was just on Joe Rogan's podcast in this month in September. And a good portion of that was spent on Alzheimer's and dementia because our that rate continues to soar. You know, 50 years ago, the rate of atherosclerosis or whatever, you know, when they would talk about the brain slowing down, but it continues to increase and it's not the familial link because they're show they're saying that only 1% really has the genetic predisposition for Alzheimer's or dementia, whatever you want to call it, but that so much of it is lifestyle choices. So what are your top three things to avoid to help us have healthy brains in our 60s, 70s and beyond? I would say alcohol, refined sugar or added sugar yeah. and a sedentary lifestyle. I mean, it's, it's more of an add in, yeah. but it really is if you don't use it, you lose it. And exercise is one of the biggest drivers of brain function. So I would say we have to move have to limit alcohol, and we really have to be mindful about the sugar in our drinks and the sugar in the food that we're eating. And that, again, it goes back to the middle of the grocery store, all those, the foods in the middle of the grocery store, the gluten, the wheat that's in them as a binder, you know, gluten's a binder, and the sugar, because you know what, it makes it taste better. It definitely makes it taste better, yeah. So it, it's really tough. So what do you do, like uh, at your birthday? Do you just have a ribeye with some candles in it? Uh, you know, what, what do you do for your dessert? Well, I, I used to do, you know, like the healthy non-dairy type of like cheesecake, which was my favorite dessert. Or then I switched to something a little healthier. I switched to chocolate covered strawberries. And then I, but I would still yeah. sometimes over consume those and not feel great. And what I realized is when one of my mentors used to say, when you stop using bad food as a treat or as a reward or like it's my birthday I get to do the bad unhealthy food that's when your entire life starts to shift and that's when people stop having alcohol or caffeine every day that's when they really start to realize that those foods are damaging not helpful so they don't become a reward they become a punishment so when you start you realizing the birthday cake should be a punishment not a reward and they're that's when it changes. And that's when I started buying like the $15 superfood latte or the smoothie with bee pollen and shilajit and CBD in it. So like that's what I do on my birthday. I go to the yeah. healthy organic places that are too expensive for me to go on a day-to-day -day basis. And I get all the superfood healthy places. I'll go to Herbin Market here in Tennessee where it's like a $28 gluten-free salmon patty burger. Like that's what I do yeah. when I treat myself instead of the deep dish pizza which is amazing in chicago but my body your event right. and eventually your body then rejects it because it knows it's not serving its highest highest purpose womp 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 i think i'm there <laughs> i've been keto carnivore since july and we were doing a treat meal once a week and the minute now gluten hits my mouth and i always said i was not gluten sensitive because i don't have celiac i don't have anything that would show that I have a sensitivity other than now, even when I had the good sourdough bread recently that I get from a bakery with the fermented butter, I had a headache so quickly after mm. that, that I, I don't want to tell sourdough bread we're breaking up yet. I'm not there emotionally, yeah. <laughs> but cause I thought sourdough bread, it's good. It's fermented, but oh, I'm just sick that the things that I can't, just, my body is telling me the next day or not even the next day, Within 15 minutes, the headache comes on. I feel really bad. Yeah. I mean, so, so many people go like, well, <laughs> wouldn't that mean, Lisa, or for Dr. Campbell, like, wouldn't that mean that you're not healthy because you can't even eat sourdough bread anymore? And the real answer is no. It's because you've cleaned up your terrain so much that your body then reacts to it. It's kind of like if your front yard, if you have like five children, your front yard looks like a war zone and there's weeds everywhere and there's 
holes dug up and, you know, the flowers are half eaten. Then if you throw another little bit of trash or another little few weeds on that yard, you're not going to notice it. But when you really clean up your yard and it's really pristine and then you throw yeah. someone teepees your house, you're going to be yeah. a lot more upset because you were spending a lot of time and money and energy on that. So our bodies work the same way. It's like someone who's homeless. If they were to go eat McDonald's three times a day, they would be so happy and they may even feel super good because they were getting three meals a day. Whereas you take Lisa and feed her McDonald's for a week, you're going to get very different results. No. Yeah. Yeah. Someone teepeed my yard with sourdough the other <laughs> night and it, even though I had the, the local farmer eggs and I had the good butter, I, I just, it was, and you know, someone else might say, oh, it was just a coincidence. No, it wasn't. I never feel food headaches and food reactions are different from a stress headache or a menstrual migraine or anything like that. There's something about this that is, it, it they TP my yard. That's all I yeah. can say. Well, at least it was I'm, really nice really toilet paper, nice soft double ply. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm really sad about it. So does that mean that I felt bad for years eating that? Or did I not, did I have the, I don't think I had the reaction. Maybe that's it. The yard had all the weeds in it so i didn't notice it, it wasn't a big deal because there were other we i had other weeds i had to deal with from probably seed oils and packaged foods and sugar and crap and all exactly. that. okay well this has been fun this has really been sad <laughs> and i really i i'm not drinking or eating crap anymore so i i'm just gonna get that fancy matcha tea when it's my birthday i guess <laughs> Fifteen dollars. Oh yeah, a lot really? of these smoothies and you know things they get pricey. <laughs> I love that. Well, good for thanks. you. I mean, you do it, and good on you. And thanks for being here. Great job today. You're a great interview. Everyone needs to follow your social media. That's all gonna be in the show notes and everything Thank you, about Lisa. you. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Lisa Fisher Said podcast. Be sure to hit subscribe and download all the episodes and leave a review, won't you? The Lisa Fisher Said Podcast is produced by ClantonCreative.com.